Okay, good evening. Welcome to the MyCP webinar series for 2022. Really uh, glad you could make it this evening. My name is Paul Gross. I'm the uh, president and CEO of the Cerebral Palsy Research Network. And I'm really excited tonight to have uh, three guests, uh, two authors and one of the featured uh, people in the book, Pure Grit. Uh, so we're gonna get started with a quick overview of the CP Research Network, and then we'll dive right into the interview with Lily and Kara, oh, I have an extra L on your name there, Lily, I've spelled it right everywhere else, and with Kara and with Isla. Okay, uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, our former name, which was, we called ourselves by our initials a lot, CPRN, and uh, an organization we merged with at the beginning of last year, CP Now. So we were both born out of a meeting that happened at the National Institutes of Health in late 2014. And at the end of that meeting, all the participants came together and the organizers handed out uh, assignments to task force that were formed uh, to do several things, to start a national CP registry, to do more clinical research comparing all the interventions, to increase the study of adults with CP, uh, to bring more young clinicians into the field so it was a vibrant and growing field, and to advance basic and translational science. And I was assigned to work on the national CP registry part of that, but over the course of the months that followed that November meeting, that turned into what became the Cerebral Palsy Research uh, Network or CPRN as we took on all of those uh, responsibilities uh, in the, the months and, and years to come. At the same time, Michelle Schusterman was at that meeting and she decided to start a not-for-profit called CP Now that was focused on providing uh, easy to read evidence um, easy to read evidence-based information for people who just got a CP diagnosis, that sort of overwhelming period. And then really to think about uh, the well-being of the, both the person with CP, but the whole family. And to think about uh, uh, what's really necessary to have um, full health and wellness in CP. And then she wanted to fund important research. Uh, so now I mentioned we came together, we merged in January, 2021. We had worked very closely together uh, throughout the period of time, the seven years before or six years before this merger, but we had four websites that we had to bring together as one. And we decided to come together under the name, the Cerebral Palsy Research Network or the CP Research Network. Uh, so our mission, it's to optimize the lifelong health and wellness of people with cerebral palsy and their families through high quality research, through education, and through community programs. So talking about our history in a combined fashion, we had several uh, key milestones over the last uh, six, seven years. We launched the CP Toolkit, which was this 83-page uh, booklet to go to people that got a new diagnosis of cerebral palsy. And that's been distributed to over uh, 4,000 members of the community. Uh, we launched a clinical registry, which was one of those core goals that came out of our work uh, at NIH in 2016, and it has over 5,000 uh, participants in the registry uh, to date. Uh, we released a well-being guide uh, that was targeted at, at doing um, some sort of self-care for parents so that they would um, balance their lives a bit with the, the challenges of taking care of a uh, a medically com complex uh, child. And we started to do translations of the toolkit into both Spanish and then Portuguese. Uh, we reached out to PCORI, the Patient-Centered um, Outcomes Research Institute, and got funding to pull together a patient-centered research agenda for cerebral palsy so that we could focus our research on the problems that the community uh, valued most. And that was conducted in 2017 and published in 2018. Uh, we've had some significant public funding milestones since then, both uh, for the registry itself and for the genetics of cerebral palsy, uh, both from the National Institutes of Health and uh, a uh, small, smaller private foundation. Uh, and then we launched a community-powered registry or a, a registry which is really aimed at capturing information about lived experience as opposed to the clinical registry, uh, which we launched in 2016. Uh, we launched that in 2019. Uh, we've also launched four what are called quality improvement initiatives. Uh, quality improvement is another way to change outcomes without conducting five-year-long research. 
uh, that's very effective for changing whole systems, which is really important for the treatment of people with cerebral palsy. And we've had four publications to date. We've done over 20 academic uh, presentations. Some have won awards for uh, their content in the past year. And we have about eight more manuscripts uh, in the hopper that are being written. One that I just heard was accepted and uh, a number more that we expect will come out over the course of this year. So what is it? It's a 501c3. Uh, it really pulls together a collaborative network of hospitals, the clinicians that treat people with CP and the, and the therapists, researchers, and patient advocates from the community to conduct research to improve outcomes for people with CP. Physically, we're a very virtual org. Physically, we're a data coordinating center at the University of Utah where the data from our registries comes from all of our hospitals or from our lived experience community uh, registry and comes together into one place uh, for those two registries. And then we're a set of education and well being programs. One of the biggest programs that we focus on is called MyCP. This is a web portal that we merged into uh, CPRN.org over the course of this, the integration of this uh, merger. And it really offers the opportunity for community members to participate in research through the community re, uh, registry through a series of surveys. But there's also a forum that is private, not indexed by Google, that allows for discussions of research and lived experience. We have clinicians there, we have industry people there, and it really gives us a great place to have some deep discussions about research and people's experiences and get evidence for various uh, treatments. Uh, we also have personalized resources. So if you come sign up for MyCP, we'll actually recommend books to you and pages on our website based on what you tell us about yourself. And we offer a free uh, virtual fitness program as well. And so anybody can sign up for that. It's entirely free at mycp.org. Uh, let me build that out. Just to give you an idea of what these registries do, this represents one data point. So on the left, we have the clinical registry, which has, this is before we had quite 5,000 patients. And this is one data point, which is the gross motor function classification scale for a person with CP. It's a very important number because it just tells us a lot about not only your mobility, but just so much about what your life course and experience may be. So for our roughly 5,000 patients, you see the distribution uh, of uh, gross motor uh, function across these different levels. And so uh, levels one through three can ambulate independently, levels four and five use a, use a wheelchair uh, for mobility. If you look at our community registry where the, the N is smaller at about a thousand, you can see the distribution is very different from the distribution you see here. And so these are people that come into hospitals. It's predominantly children's hospitals, but about 18 to 20% of it are adults. Uh, these are people that are just uh, signing up through the community registry. And so you see the distribution of their uh, mobility. This GMFCS is very different. So we use this type of data to both offer services and to help guide research in ways that really can help accelerate uh, both care and research. So overall, our programs are focused on engaging the community. Uh, that's, a, that's that research CP group that we had 45 people in Chicago in 2017. Our last face-to-face -face investigator meeting was in Michigan in uh, 2019. And there we are in front of that pond in the upper right. And then our toolkits are, and MyCP are our core educational resources. And then we have health and well being programs. So the network is spread out across uh, North America. The green pins represent sites that are actively collecting data. The yellow pins are working on the technology aspects of that. The red pins are working on some of the compliance and IT issues before the technology. Uh, and then blue sites are sites that have raised their hand and said, uh, blue pins are sites that have raised their hand and said they wanna participate in, in the network. And you can find all the details about these sites at cprn.org. So we exist uh, to in, in the research front to accelerate research. That's really a core portion of why we were uh, founded. And so on the left-hand side, we have uh, our, our open end of our funnel where we want ideas to come in and we'll take ideas from anywhere. They can come from within the network. They can come from community members. They can come from outside of the network. 
uh, and we work them through a process of defining them, getting them approved, uh, getting them funded, implementing them, uh, and then, and pardon me, I'm going to go back to meeting all, uh, and then uh, publishing the results. And then we take the evidence that we generate and we roll it back into the process of care. So that really gives, that's the, the sort of quick overview of the network. I'm really excited to turn to the next uh, phase of this MyCP webinar, which is uh, to start an interview with Lily Collison, whose name I spelled right in that uh, line, fortunately, uh, Kara Buckley and Isla Eckhoff uh, as the authors and one of the, the key people featured in the book, Pure Grit. Before I start my, my questions, uh, I just want to say, let me actually arrange my arrange the screen as I hope to go from here. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna see if I can pin my, my speakers um, to, to sort of join me. Um, oh, I just saw Isla. Uh, and then I just need to find Kara and there's Kara. Okay. All right, um, so uh, I've known Lily for, for quite some time. Um, we did an interview when she did her, her last book, Spastic Diplegia, Bilateral Cerebral Palsy. Uh, we both have uh, children with, um, with uh, bilateral cerebral palsy, and uh, we've really developed a, a great uh, friendship and, and relationship. And she told me about uh, this book that was being worked on, and she knew that I had a, I have a, a bit of a reading difficulty, and I do not, uh, I do not read text well. I'm, I'm slow. I'm like a snail. I, my wife has diagnosed me with dyslexia. She has no degree to diagnose me with dyslexia. So I do audiobooks, and uh, she promised that this would come out in audiobook form, and I took it immediately uh, and and just uh, gobbled it up. It was great, and. You know, for me, I want to just say that it was both illuminating about disability, even though I have a son with a disability, it really helped me spark conversations with him. And he hasn't read it yet. Um, he's very super interested. He's just, you know, very busy with school. Uh, but it's really engendered a lot of conversations. Uh, and I just found the, the perspectives on, on disability and language and the people just fascinating. And then I was incredibly moved. I will say that I was, I was uh, reading the book while riding uh, my bike, training for, for bike racing. And the story of Daniel Diaz, when his son said, dad, I just wanna be like you. And he said, okay, here's what you need to do to get into sport. And he said, no, dad, I wanna be with you. I don't, like you, I don't wanna have arms or legs. And I just was so moved by how inspiration how inspirational of a person Daniel Diaz was that that's what like I wanted that for my son to say that to me. So totally independent of, of disability, just that much of a role model. And so that's why it was so powerful. So I really would recommend the book to everyone, but I wanna dive in and start to ask some questions. So if we can just go uh, Lily, uh, Kara and Isla and say a little bit about yourselves and how you know you it, it came to pass that you got involved with this book, that would be great. Oh, you're muted. Let me let me unmute you if you can't unmute yourself. Um, yeah. There you go. Nope, you're happened again. Lily, you're you're muted for me. That could there you go. I can yeah. hear you now. You okay. Yeah. Um, like Paul, um, as Paul said, I have an adult, a now adult son with spastic diplegia and, you know, which led me to writing the first book on spastic diplegia. And I, what, um, so what brought me to write this book, um, Pure Grit, uh, was Kara really, Kara and I have been friends for a number of years and Kara gave me a book struggling with serendipity. And um, that book was written by a by the mother of a teenage girl who became paralyzed in um, who became paralyzed in a car accident, and she went on to um, she went on to Harvard because she saw a billboard 
of a, a graduate of Harvard in a wheelchair, a girl like her sitting in, in, in a, a wheelchair user who was graduating Harvard. And that shone a light of, on possibility for her. And like when I read that, when Kara gave me that book and I read it, I found it very powerful. And I had written, I had completed the spastic diplegia book. And just the whole thing, there was research I had read when writing that, which um, compared to the typical population, people with spastic diplegia, which is largely a mild to moderate physical disability, largely without cognitive impairment, but yet compared to the typical population, people with spastic diplegia are underrepresented in employment, underrepresented in relationships and in having children. And that, that piece of research really fuels any advocacy work I do, because I find that very powerful, that if people with a mild to moderate physical disability, largely without cognitive impairment, are so disenfranchised in this, you know, these, you know, participation in adult life, you know, we have to improve, you know, to do whatever to improve that. But um, I just saw a need for a book of role models, you know what I mean? And I chatted with Kara about it. And I said to Kara, come on, Kara, we have to write a book of role models. So I'll hand over to Kara. That's where you go, Great. Kara. Great. Okay, go ahead, yeah. Kara. Yeah, so, um, so Lily came to me with this idea and I, I mean, I jumped at the chance to be able to, to work on this project with her. And I think what, um, what really drove me was this, um, for me, it was about learning more about disability. I work with the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee. I'm a senior advisor. And one out of every three athletes that I work with has a disability. And so for me, it's really important that I have a deeper understanding and a better understanding of that lived experience so that I can support the athletes that, that you know, I work to, to help. And I think um, what I found so interesting about this experience was just the generosity of everyone we interviewed at their time throughout this, you know, COVID pandemic of being willing to spend an hour, sometimes two or three hours to be interviewed for our book and then come back and, you know, just be so open and vulnerable about their stories, which we'll share more about today. Um, That's one of, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, I would say one of one of the most powerful that has moved me and I just every time I read your chapter Isla I'm moved again is just what you have shared about your own lived experiences and and the idea that um, grit is such a lived truth for you that you helped really define what the, the title of the book is like you embody what that means. Tell us about yourself Isla I mean how did how did this opportunity come in front of you and why did you say yes to it. Yeah it's really kind of interesting so I sit on. Um, Right now, I'm actually a managing director at BlackRock, but I also sit on the board of the Cerebral Palsy Foundation and another uh, philanthropic organization called Respectability. Um, and um, Rachel Byrne, who's the director of, of CPF, said, hey, have you um, met Lily Collison? And I said, who's Lily Collison? Oh, she's written a book on spastic diplegia. Okay, so what's spastic diplegia? And she said, you know, that's funny that you say that, but..." I think that's the form of CP that you have. So it's really kind of interesting. So uh, Rachel hooked me up with Lily. Lily sent me a copy of the book. Um, I had been looking for that book probably since I was about, I don't know, 13, 14 years old and never found anything that I could read that actually made sense to me. Everything was extremely medical uh, and clinical. And I really didn't have an understanding of, of my CP and, and how it worked. I mean, I, I've... Uh, I was born with CP, actually spastic diplegia from birth. I've had over a dozen surgeries. So when I found Lily's book, um, I started texting her on, on the weekends. Like as I read a chapter, I, I asked her a question, send her notes, uh, give her some ideas. And by the time I was done, uh, Lily said, oh, I'm working on another project. Um, it's a book about people with disabilities. Would you be interested in being interviewed? And I'm Okay, so sure, why not? Little did I know that that the other 18 people that are in this book are Paralympians and, and people that basically started the disability movement in this country. So uh, why I'm in this book? Uh, well, we can sort of debate that at another point, but um, meeting Lily and, and first reading Spastic Diplegia and then being a part of this group has really changed my life and my outlook. So I am forever grateful to, to Lily and Kara for including me in their story. 
That's that's great. I'm going to come back to uh, how how it's changed at another point. I've got a question for that, but um, can you say so? Uh, you know, we get the sense of how you got connected for Lily and Kara. Like, how about the rest of the people that you chose? How did you go about choosing them? Sort of, what were your what was your process on that? Do you want to go with that, Kara? Yeah, I know. I'm happy to. Um, so we we set out to really tell a diverse amount of stories across. Um, age groups across um, industry, um, across nationalities. And so we we wanted to really give a holistic view, not just, you know, from my background, not just the sports view, right? Or, you know, not just kind of the academic view. And so we, um, with that in mind, we put together kind of a, a wish list. And what was amazing is everybody said yes. So when we, um, when we went to Isla and we went to Rachel and, you know, we went to these these like just amazing people who were again so generous with their time they were so open and willing to share their own life story um and i think what we found is that um the way that the stories came together when you read or listen to the book in the audiobook form is that you get this really interesting narrative of very different lived experiences and there's common themes throughout which is pretty cool to see and how many people were raised and some of the parenting approaches um or just you know the idea of um you know ways people found community regardless of the industry they they chose in their life um but the idea of learning about different types of disabilities from different you know people from different backgrounds i think makes it a like a richer experience to to read or, or listen to the book um, and lily feel free to to add to that too yeah and no, i suppose but um um like we wanted that um sort of the audience for the book would be able to really relate to the book so like we felt it was important to have um, um people um, succeeding in different fields but people across the ages gender uh, race you know just a very broad um, a group of people. And like Kara said, you know, we made a list, like Kara and I had a database of the people. So we started asking people and that's what, shot, like, like if you asked me about, you know, how would you go about writing a book like this? I would have expected us to ask people, you know, get rejections and all that everybody said yes immediately and that's what shocked us and people didn't know us like judy human wouldn't have known you know like you know isla wouldn't have known like people didn't okay isla would have met me through the spastic diplegia book but generally people didn't know us but yet they were willing and i suppose what we were trying to do people believed in you know just writing the stories of people who had um, been successful a whole across a whole load of different fields and you know people were just so generous with their stories and so frank and so you know weren't afraid to show their vulnerabilities and it was I must say I thought I knew a little bit about a little bit just about disability before we started Pure Grit but I realized I knew very very little I learned like um, interviewing and talking with the 19 storytellers I learned so much like it was a so year gonna, of learning for me. So I'm going to ask my my next question in sort of reverse uh, order. So Isla, what what besides grit do you feel like if you think about your life, what do you really feel like made a difference in how you've been able to achieve all that you've been able to achieve? I think a lot of it has to do with um, how you're raised and, and what you sort of come in contact with from a very early age. So um, my parents, my dad in particular, uh, always took the approach that I could do anything. He would ask me two questions. You know, how bad do you want it? And what are you willing to give up to get it? Because you only have so much time in the day. You have one brain, two hands. There's only so much you're going to be able to do. But you can do anything you want to do, assuming you make up your mind and how bad, how much work are you willing to do to achieve what it is you want. And he let me fail and let me fall and let me learn. Right. So I think um, what I, you know, I used to try and hide my CP. I grew up you know, trying to minimize it all the time. I'd go to job interviews. I'd try and hide my cane under a desk or behind a door. When I, If I got there early enough, I'd find a chair, sit down, see if I could figure out how to hide it so that somebody could meet me without any preconception uh, or, you know, any, uh, you know, just notion about whether or not I could do certain things. Um, and it's interesting how as you get older and you sort of take ownership of all the parts 
uh, that make up your life. I now look at my CP as my superpower, right? Um, it, it's what propels me. It's what drives me to constantly do better, learn more, do new things. And I think that's the gift that I try to give to my children, right? So I expect a great deal of them, but I fundamentally believe that they can do anything they set their mind to. So I, I think, you know, it, it's up to parents to give kids the belief that they can do anything and, and then you have to work through it. That's great. Um, Lily, can you talk a little bit about your experience, uh, you know, interviewing all these people and then what Isla talked about with parents and, and the environment and like, what, what did you learn uh, from these people that maybe you would have done differently or you feel like, yeah, I did really well um, as a parent? I suppose as a parent, you don't focus on what you did well, you sort of focus on what would I have done differently? And like, yes, I suppose, you know, and like it was a point you and I um, uh, talked about, um, Paul, and like Isla alluded to there, like the importance of failure, letting kids, um, you know, like say kids with spastic diplegia have a balance problem, letting kids learn through falling because you only learn how to walk through falling. You know, any kid, any toddler falls a lot, but I think us parents are a little bit more inclined to sort of um, um, protect our children with a disability. You know, like every child, you know, um, with or without a disability learns to, you know, it, you're, typical toddler learns through falling. Our child with spastic diplegia has to learn, you know, to be allowed to fall, be, you know, be you know, allowed to um, make mistakes, not to protect, not to be overprotective. And like some of the stories, you know, some of the storytellers, the importance of building confidence, the importance, you know, of um, building confidence, the importance of helping your, any child, you know, be it um, with a, a, a disability or non-disabled, but, you know, finding what they're passionate about, you know, and helping them. And like the storytellers in the book, they found areas in which they could excel. So there were so many, you know, the, like a number of the storytellers talked about what advice they would give parents. And I think the book is rich for the advice that the storytellers would give parents. And I think it applies disability or no disability. I, I agree with that one wholeheartedly. And that's one of the things that's great about this book, because the messages, I think, generalize towards mm -hmm. what do you need to do to create remarkable people? And this just mm -hmm. is, you know, the disability is, is, an, is an angle or a, a piece of, you know, of this. So, um, and, I, you know, I certainly feel like we put too much bubble wrap around my son. You know, he's got a, an additional, he's got hydrocephalus, so he's got an additional, you know, concern about his head. But we, we. Could we babied him too much? We so I think it's great learning. Kara, I gather you're a, you're a mom of young children. I'm curious, reading the book, hearing all these, what will you do differently now that you've read this book? And or what do you, you know, yeah, what will you do differently? It's such a great question. I have a one-year-old and a four-year-old, and my one-year-old has been a big part of writing this book. Um, she was born a month before we started um, wow. started writing it, so I <laughs> I have pictures with her, you know, with the completed manuscript. Anyway, it's um it's been special to you know feel like she's actually she's been a huge part of it. Um, so man, there's a few things, and um I think um one of them is um is about removing limitations. I think that what I learned from so many people is they were told at a very young age that this defining experience of their life started their identity as a child, right? The people we interviewed um, were diagnosed typically in, in childhood, right? And that was, a, that was a pretty important part of the people we chose to interview for the book. And so this idea that you can place these limitations and you can really direct a child by stating words like won't, can't, or never, and that that sticks, right? And that overcoming that over, you know, you don't know yet what your child is capable of, right? And that, that can be really, really hard, um, mm -hmm. especially with disability, and, but the same goes without, right? It's the idea of letting the child dictate what, what is possible in their life. Um, and another one I think is um, this idea that was so fascinating to see every, every person we, we interviewed had one really supportive and loving person adult in their mm. life. And it, it was at least one, and it was usually a parent, but that made a huge difference, right. in in you know, the outcome of that child's life. And I think what each of those people did was really 
enable the child to discover what they love and what they enjoy, right? And that turned into a passion that fueled, you know, this eventual definition of success and whatever that success looks like, right? It doesn't have to be the world's best Paralympian, right? It is personally defined and we didn't want to set, you know, define what that success looks like for every individual person. But I think that idea of letting kids discover what it is um, and explore a variety of things. A lot of the, you know, athletes explored a number of sports before they picked one, right? And so I think discovery was really important. Do you think the love was tough love? Like from everybody, like uh, I'm gonna come back to you, Isla, because the, the, box, <laughs> the boxing story really made me think it must be tough love, but was it tough love or was it just, just a loving supportive environment? I think it's giving you the opportunity to just sort of try everything, right? And, and, you know, being told it's okay to fail. Like, okay, we all have things we're good at and things we're not good at, regardless disability or not. If everybody would just focus on the stuff that they're good at, then we can all sort of move things along in a positive direction. But in order to do that, you have to be able to fail. Yeah. I mean, no matter how smart anybody is, I, I don't care who you are, I have certainly learned much more from failure than I have from success, right? The only way I got to success is that I failed a whole bunch of times at a whole bunch of things, right? When I, when I went to school, I originally wanted to be a doctor, but organic chemistry and I, we didn't get along. So that didn't work out, right? Ultimately, you know, I got a degree in, in economics and then got a master's in accounting. And, and now I, and I've been working in finance for over 35 years. Right. And I'm a managing director at the biggest asset manager in the world. And I couldn't be happier in that path. But I had to fail at the thing that I thought I was going to do for the rest of my life in order for me to find that. So, yeah, um, one of one of the best bosses I ever had in, in the interview, he always asked me about my failures. He kept like <laughs> it, was, it was interesting, but it's because he wanted to see what I learned from my failures. So I, I think that that makes a ton of sense. Um, Lily, if you think about uh, the common the common themes, be like what beyond grit and the supportive environment? What are some of the other things you found were consistent across uh, people that you interviewed? Um, I, like I suppose, yeah, like the like the most it, the support of um, family or community. You know, like it wasn't always family, like. Um, um, uh, where's I've got a copy of the book of the book out? It was, um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, um, um, Jim Abbott, where he talked about community, like he came from Flint, um, the town of Flint, and he said that the town folks, you know, the townsfolk, you know, were so um important in helping kids get into sport rather than getting into um you know less desire you know like that the flint had problems but that you know sort of teachers coaches really helped children get into sport you know and they helped him you know what i mean he had a disability he was probably more likely or you know to sort of not get involved in sport they went the extra mile with him. Uh, Chantal Petty Clark, she talked about how her teachers, so it wasn't all just family, it was right. also at school. She talked about how important her teachers, she had a teenage um, accident um, and a spinal injury, how important her teachers were um, um, to, you know, sort of her, you know, career and like, the little town she came from in Canada, she, you know, she still has such appreciation for the folk from that town because they made such a difference in her life. So as well as family, it's community, you know, be community, be it school, be it town. And um, um, like it's independent of family financial circumstances. You know what I mean? Uh, it was totally like um, family financial circumstances had nothing to do with it people succeeded regardless of what the circumstances were. And um, um, I suppose it's the, it, like Kira mentioned, finding fields that they really were interested. And like parents can help 
kids, I think, you know, explore and find what they're interested in. You know what I mean? Like it's finding some area in life that you can excel, that you can excel. You know what I mean? And I think that applies to any of us. You know what I mean? Uh, for some role models were important, you know, for some, um, you know, they themselves having a role model um, was important. Um, um, and like Isla said, learning from failure, like there's so, like I could give a load more, but there's some of them, you know, that I think like I call it kind of like, what was the secret sauce? You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's how I kind of think of it. And when when we started interviewing, um, you know, when we started doing the interviews, I remember sort of watching for that. What's the secret sauce? How did these people become so remarkable in their in a whole load of different fields? And like, you know, sort of and some were very young, like the youngest person we interviewed was 20, you know, right up to 70s plus, you know, and like you were trying to look and like Kara mentioned can't, won't, uh, never. You know, I would have thought those words now, even though they were spoken to me about my son, that he can't, he won't and all this, you know, like there were negative predictions made. You know, I heard those negative predictions. I thought, you know, things would have improved negative predictions young parents are still hearing very negative predictions and we need to you know because the kids you know sort of uh, do much better than their negative predictions so I think people need to watch what they're saying to the parents of young children I could go on I'll, I'll stop there so, for so I'd be curious if you think that so you've got these um, you know, the role of role models the family community support as being other things uh, the role of failure um, do you think that grit is a learned skill from uh, from these things, or do you think it's you know it's inborn? I, you know, Isla, you know, you're, you're one of the, one of the people. What do you yeah. think? I mean, it, grit's kind of a funny thing. So there's a book by Angela Duckworth that I'm still reading. I haven't finished it yet. That's actually called Grit, and and she did a tremendous amount of research saying that grit was really um, it, it's the thing that really separates people that are uh, that ultimately uh, get to be successful in whatever they choose to do. Um, and it, it, she looks at it separately from intellect and, and studying and, and socioeconomic kind of things and what have you. Um, because I think it's, grit to me is resilience, right? The reason why failure is so important is it's not the falling down that's the problem. It's the inability to get, get back up, up yeah. right? So, so what separates people with grit from people without grit is not people that can just be successful because they're just good at everything or lucky or have the right circumstance or whatever. Grit is the thing that helps those who get knocked down over and over and over again, but just keep getting back up. Right? Yeah. So yeah. like for me, I mean, I, I fall all the time. I mean, I, I fell in July and for the first time I broke something because and I've fallen probably 10,000 times in my life and it's the first time I've done that. These things happen, right? But but resilience is something, it, it's a muscle that you have to exercise. I don't, I don't know if grit is innate. I think on, on a certain level, I would like to think that it, it can be um, coached, right? Yeah. So if you if you put positive uh, ideas and thoughts into a child's mind that they can succeed regardless of whatever they want, if they're willing to work hard enough, do certain things in order to get there, go to school, blah, 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 what, whatever those things are to achieve that success. So some of it I think can be coached because if you develop that ability of just thinking you can do everything that no matter what goes wrong, you just keep trying a different angle to get there, right? I mean, look, there's there's a lot of successful people that have disabilities. Look at the Elon yeah. Musks and the Richard Branson's and, and the what have you, right? It, it's really about, and, and I think my role in the book, and it took me a while to figure out why Lily actually wanted me in the book. And, and I think it's because my mindset is around economics and around mm -hmm. business and finance. That's what I do for a living. But mm -hmm. to me, um, employment is really the, the secret to how we change things. Because if people with disabilities who are 77% are unemployed, right, or underemployed, if they can all get a job doing 
you know, whatever things that, that they want to do. I mean, we have a huge pool and lots of unemployment these days. There's lots of people that need a job and lots of people looking for work. If we can get all these people employed, that changes the economic pie for everybody. And right. it's been proven, like Anderson Consulting did a lot of research, that, that firms that hire people with disabilities and particularly have diverse you know, teams across the spectrum are 30 to 35% more profitable. So this is not something that's like a nice to have, right, right? Right. This is a good business decision that will make your company better, make your business better. And people with disabilities have been proven. And I don't know where I got this fact, but I think it's somewhere from some Special Olympics data where um, people with disabilities particularly excel at certain soft skills, team mm -hmm. building, collaboration, uh, those types of things that, that are emotional really, intelligence kind of uh, that's aspect. correct yeah yeah right so 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 that aspect makes them great team builders and and leaders uh, in a lot of different areas across industries across markets so it's a win for everybody and and that job and that economic independence gives them an option to make their own choices and don't we all as human beings deserve the right to make our own choices on how our lives get led, not by yep. somebody else, right? And, and economic independence is what will enable those people to do that, right? Yep. So if they can't support themselves, it's pretty hard to do. So mm -hmm. I, I'm really focused on, we have to get more people with disabilities employed and we have to change the, the stigma around employing people with disabilities because it'll make your firm better. No, that's, I hear here, great, great uh, points. Uh, Lily, did you want to say something? No, I would just add to what Isla said, two points there, is like when you think how late disability came to the party, you know what I mean, that Civil Rights Act was, you know, so many years ahead of the ADA, you know what I mean, that's one thing, but the other thing is, Jaron Herman, the guy, um, um, the, he's a professional dancer and writer um, mm -hmm. uh, based in New York, and Jaron has hemiplegia, but he is a black, uh, he um, is a black dancer and writer who has a disability and he said his his color was never an issue it's his disability that he experienced discrimination and i thought that really you know sort of uh, stayed with me that he was comparing color and disability and he said his his experience of discrimination was around disability not around color and that i found very profound you know that he could compare the two and he felt disability was a much bigger problem, which, you know, spoke a lot to me. Yeah, yeah, gosh, it's powerful. Yeah. Um, Cara, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to open it up for questions in a second, but I'm curious if with your work and exposure uh, to Olympic athletes, uh, any, have you heard any particular act, uh, reaction from that, you know, that audience of people about the book? Yeah, I've had um, several colleagues and athletes have read the book. And um, uh -huh. I think what's so interesting is um, there's, prob there's probably three things that have come up. And the first is just that, um, you know, I think it was three years ago, the organization changed its name. It was traditionally the Olympic Committee, and then it expanded and actually, you know, put Paralympics in the acronym, right? And that inserted disability into every conversation that where it didn't before. And so there are people that have been there for 10 or 20 plus years working at the organization who also did not have like a very deep understanding of disability that this book helped them really understand, you know, where the gaps were and even things like preferred language. And it just sparked a lot of conversations with colleagues. Um, I'd say the second is, you know, my background's in marketing. And so the, the book also has sparked a lot of conversations around what is the narrative of storytelling, especially around the broadcast of the Paralympics. And I think it's mm -hmm. actually opened up a way for people to be really honest and self-critical. Um, and I think in a really healthy way to say, we have a lot of room for improvement. Yep, we're, we're making some great strides, but there is a lot of room for improvement in the way that we tell stories and the way that we can um, show, you know, disability on this, you know, grand global stage, you know, every two years for these games. Um, and so I think that has has caused a lot of people to say, hey, we have a, we have a ways to go, right? Um, but we, you know, we acknowledge that we we need to improve the way that we're storytelling. And then I think I think the last one is just about um, just about like you know empathy and really developing an understanding and a need to have more teammates with disabilities at the organization. So 
um, was really lucky to hire um, an amazing woman actually who also works with um, CP Foundation and is um, is just a great advocate for disability. And you know, she's also helping us think through how can we as an organization advocate for better policies and um, you know economic opportunities for athletes that will then expand to you know larger disability population. Uh, that that's great. That makes sense. You know. Uh, one of the things that the book introduced me to was the, the Netflix uh, uh, Rising Phoenix, and uh, and I always wonder whether or not I've got the name reversed, but I think I've got it right. So, and that the the place that the Brazil Olympics plays and what happens with the Paralympics during that, both when it seems like it's going to get totally dissed and then it saves the day, is so powerful. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure there's a lot of support for the direction you're going there. Let me uh, let me open it up for uh, for uh, Q and A. Um, so anybody who so let me first say before people say. Thank you so much for all of you writing the book, spending the time being in the book, uh, you know, talking to me. This is great, uh, and I personally would recommend the book to uh, to everyone. Um, I really look forward to my son reading it just because of all the dialogue it sparked already. So, hats off to you, congratulations! Uh, but if you can stick around and we can spend uh, the next you know ten minutes or so taking any questions, that'd be great. And I'm thinking I will go to, I don't know if I should unpin, unpin people or not, but um, does anybody have uh, a question for our authors or for Isla? I can always just keep, uh, let's see, there's one in here. There's, um, I'm gonna just read one from uh, uh, Poonam who said, I can't wait to read the, the book. Uh, um, have you covered the, the social aspect in the book, developing friendships and relationships outside the family? Uh, how were physical barriers overcome in socializing? Um, I, you know, this is where I haven't, I, I read the book, but I'll let you guys comment on it. Uh, do you feel like that was touched on at all? Do you want to go, are you going there, Kara? You look. I'm, I'm happy to. I think one of the things that I was surprised to hear is just um, many children found physical therapy and occupational therapy just really isolating. And so a lot of time was just spent on, you know, their own physical development, but that kept them away from peers and even other people with disabilities because they were in those private sessions. And so I think one of the things that was interesting is when, when children, and I'm thinking about this from the sports perspective, so Lily and Isla, please balance me out, but when children did explore, you know, participating in sports, um, that gave them more community and especially swimming would seem to be one that that, um, you know, many people we interviewed, um, even running was another one that a lot of people found. Um, so I think that that was just a really interesting way for people to connect with community. Um, um, adding to that, um, to Kara's point, like actually my own son, you know, sort of so he would have had a lot of time, say, with physical ther uh, therapy and he. It was the day he realized that if he did exercise the same as his brothers, that what that would, you know, sort of, um, you know, it was a game changer when he realized he could do his physical therapy, you know, with a physical, uh, with a personal trainer, with at a gym, you know what I mean? And it was, you know, a huge moment for him, you know, to sort of um, do um, his, you know, and he knew he needed to do a lot of exercise, but to do it in a regular setting, he really loved that, you know what I mean? Like a number of stories did talk about that, you know, like um, Kara, I'm remembering Tani, you know, did talk about that. And I, I suppose the whole area of community around sport in terms of, you know, sort of participating in sport and the community that brought. So it just, in, how are the physical barriers overcome in socializing? Um, like, I suppose for a lot of people, sport brought community. Uh, community. Do you want to add to it, Isla? I mean, uh, look, I think um, everybody's got to pick the things that they want to play. So there were certain games, for instance, growing up, that I couldn't play, but then I would sort of push the group or, or the kids on my block or in my gym class or whatever to play games that I could actually participate in. Ultimately, I ended up training, for example, in ninjutsu and I have a blue belt, right? But that's because I walked into a dojo and the, and, and, uh, the sensei actually wanted to teach me and started keeping canes in the dojo until he talked me into taking a class. And then I was hooked, right? So it, 
you know, you, you have to figure out, you, you're not going to be able to do everything necessarily the way everybody else does, but that doesn't mean you can't play and can't participate, right? So, yeah. you know, don't be shy. You know, yeah. if, if, if you want to play, then go play. You may not play the same way everybody yeah. else does, whatever that yeah. is. Yeah. Um, but, but there's lots of different ways to adapt uh, a given activity so that you can be included and participate with everybody else. And good coaches and good teachers are very yeah. good at making it sort of it inclusive for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Let me uh, just because some of the chatter in the chat, let me just say um, somebody just said they couldn't find the book on Amazon. Somebody else shared the link. But what are the, the easiest ways to get the book? I know this wasn't intended to be the sort of book sales event, but I but by all means, people are dying to get their hands Amazon. on it. So Amazon is Amazon probably is, the easiest way. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, um, it's on Amazon. There should be no problem getting it on Amazon and like come back to us if there is, you know, but there should be no. Uh, Carol will probably add, I see Carol there. Yeah, there should be no problem with Amazon. Great, yeah, no, uh, she, she added that. Um, okay, uh, I have more questions that I can ask, but I really wanna uh, not you know, dominate all the, all the Q&A. Does anybody else, uh, there's a bunch of comments that I'd recommend that uh, the three of you read in because they're all quite positive in the chat, but um, any other questions from the audience? Yeah. All right. Well, I don't see one. You can unmute, but I'm going to I'm going to reach out. Uh, Isla, in our conversation, you talked about the role of meditation in your life. And it's really interesting because I have a friend who's he's up to two hours a day of meditation. And I heard your strategy and I was like, yeah. I'm an Isla kind of person. But can you talk a little <laughs> yeah, bit about the, um, the role of meditation in your life? Uh, yeah, I have very little uh, patience. And um, so there was a meditation practice that started at Black Rock with about eight of us sitting in a conference room. And it was 20 minutes at a clip. Um, and it, it started out with just a handful of us. And now I think there's a few thousand around the firm. But one of the meditations uh, that the woman who was leading it uh, talked about was a gratitude meditation. Um, so what are the five things you're grateful for? Write them on a post-it. For me, it's very easy. I have my five things, but I, I've adapted my practice to a one minute meditation. So if you put my name in and put in Thrive Global, and I think it's gratitude meditation is the title, you'll, you'll see my practice, but it's literally take the five things you're most grateful for, write them on a post-it. I, I sit in a chair, take a deep breath, say those five things and my blood pressure goes down and I'm much more relaxed. And it only takes one minute. So I dare anybody to tell me that they don't have one minute to, to get focused and clear their head and, and just you know be able to do things better. I have a basically very stressful job. I have a tendency sometimes to lose my focus and um, my one minute practice really helps me throughout the workday. I do it the first thing when I get up in the morning. I do it the last thing when I go to bed at night. Um, and it just keeps me focused on what are the things in my life that are most important to me that I'm really grateful for. And, and disability or not, everything that I've been through to this point, you know, has led me to where I am, which I'm, I'm pretty happy with. So the one other thought I'll leave you with is disability is the, we are the largest minority on the planet. It impacts roughly 15 to 20 percent of the globe. It also impacts over a trillion dollars in buying power. So anybody who's running a business, if you think you don't need to uh, be cognizant of people with disabilities when you're putting your products or your, you know, whatever you've got going on out there, um, you're mistaken, right? So uh, and disability can hit you at any time. So uh, uh, whether I'm fortunate or not, I or not, I have it from birth. Uh, other people in, in, the, in the book uh, were subject to accidents and other things going on. Disability can hit you at any time. And at some point in your life, and that may be when you're 95 years old, it will come and get you. It does not discriminate. It likes everybody. So um, it, it's a part of the human condition and it's a part that everybody's gonna have to experience at some point. So the more we, you know, we get rid of the stigma and the negatives around disability and just accept it as a part of the human condition, I think the better off we're all gonna be. Well, that's great. I think that's, uh, we're right at the top of the hour and I think that's a great uh, note to end on. So 
uh, Lily and Kara, thank you so much for writing this book and having the impact that you're going to have uh, with it and, and have had and will continue to have. Isla, thanks for sharing your story, both in the book and with more detail tonight. I, I really greatly appreciate uh, all of you. So thanks for your time. Thank you so Paul. much for having us. Yes. Good night. Yes. Hey, can I say something before we leave? Yeah, go ahead. Uh. Um, I was just thinking about when she was discussing seen employment and I find like the biggest issue it may not necessarily always be so much about getting being able to get a job it's for a lot of people with disabilities they're kind of trapped on social security because you're kind of damned if you do damned if you don't because not because you lose your health insurance at least for people in the U.S. that live in the U.S. and it's just a, that is the part where, where I think that makes it so much harder for somebody with a disability to work is healthcare. Yeah. And Judy Human, Judy, like that exact point that you, you brought up um, uh, so well there, that Judy Human, who is one of the people in the book, that's something she is fighting very strongly. You know, you're, you're so right. And, it, you know, it's some, it's it's a, an issue that Judy is really working on. Tirelessly. She's. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All Sorry right. if. Uh, yeah, no worries. Too, I, I just. Wanted no, to bring no, that up before we end. Yeah, no, it's a very valid point. I, I appreciate it, Alex. All right, once again, good night, everybody. It's later on the East Coast. Uh, I'm going to go down and have dinner. You guys can go to bed. Thank you all. It was nice. Thanks, Thanks you all Paul. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Thanks.